seriously because he's too accessible, but uh, he, he actually, you know, earned his own Pulitzer Prizes and whatever. Uh, so we'll start by uh, stopping by the by woods on a snowy evening, which is uh, not too snowy tonight. Wouldn't it be nice? Because what's his art? I think I know. His house is in the village, so he will not see me stopping here. To watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lakes, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sound is the sweep of an easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Now this is a, another poem which has a modern resonances as does the one to follow. This is a Mending Wall by Robert Brown. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. That stands the ground, frozen ground swell under it. And spills it up for boulders in the sun and makes the gaps even too compass and rest. The work, work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair when they have left not one stone on a stone. But they would have the rabbit out of Hattie to please the helping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill. And on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. To each, the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, and one on the side. It comes to a little more. There it is where we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I'm apple door. My apple trees would never get a cross length of homes under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> Sp spring is a mystery for me. And I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors, isn't it? Where there are cows, but here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was rolling in or rolling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down, I could say, elves oh, Sam. But it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone rest firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage arm. <coughs> he lives in darkness, as it seems to be, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying. And he likes having thought of it so well, he says it again. Good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> so. so another poem become newly political. This is uh, 
The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, oh, God. who uh, <laughs> was uh, not a famous poet, but uh, you know, actually a, a, a rising young poet, who wrote this as uh, part of a fundraising for the Statue of Liberty, and was uh, sort, of, sort, of, sort of belatedly became famous. And uh, this is now famous because the last part you'll recognize, they're engraved on the wall of the uh, Statue of Liberty now. This was written before the thing had been completed, and they're trying to raise money for it. So, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, this is the new Colossus, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here, at our sea-washed sunset gate, shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand blows worldwide welcome. From wild eyes command the air bridge harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient land, your storied pomp, cross she with silence. Give me your tired, your poor, your public, public masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send those, the homeless, tempest house to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Knithist, mm. or the knit, the ballad of the knithist, and the knithist is someone who knits. Oh, knit, knit. I knit. I knit. The devil is love. The devil is love. I saw God the other night as I was dreaming by firelight, an old, old lady sitting there knitting in a rocking chair. The wool around her fingers curled, for she was knitting all the world. There came a scratching down the hall. It was the devil come to call. The devil is never far away. He comes to visit every day. I So she got up and let him in, a cat that's big and dark as sin. She said, you look the worst for wear. He said, you know, you've got me there, for you must know that I must go over the earth, both to and fro. And 
walking up and down on it. I got no time to stay and sit. <laughs> The devil is never far away. He comes to She went for food. When she went out, the cat got up and danced about and said, it's time to have some fun. And he unraveled all she'd done. And then he took the woolen ball and batted it from wall to wall. She brought back the milk and bread. He ate it up. And then he said, a devil is never away. He comes to visit. to visit every night. And now I have to move along to do my work and sing my song. She opened the door and he went out into the night of dark and doubt. Oh, now I've lost it. <laughs> the lady sat back down and then she said as she started to knit again, Till fire shall freeze and ice shall burn, that poor old cat will never learn. The devil is never far away. He comes to visit every day. I for dear at the Lord and candle light. He comes to Everybody come through. Come here. There's 
my life's life, life's not what was meant to be, oh, meant to be, oh, could it be that nothing is guaranteed? It's a long, long road, <coughs> the past has been mean. Can I hold your hand? I'm tired and cold. I don't know where to go. because all the other Irish poets were not peasants, and he felt he was one of them, even though he had been a farmer and a poor man for many, many years, and wrote the great poem, The Great Hunger, which is a kind of national anthem, and even though later he thought that wasn't such a great poem, he did write a song to, a, words to a poem that, were, that he wanted to put to the ancient Irish melody of the dawning of the day, and there are several verses historically of that. But he wrote on Raglan Road to be put to this historic common tune. And um, I told Michael, I asked Michael, who sings here every New Year's Eve and he's here, would he please sing Patrick Kavanaugh's On Raglan Road, which, uh, do any of you know it, On Raglan Road? <coughs> it's a kind of national anthem, and I thought, why is this story about a middle-aged man who falls in love with the young woman who rejects him? Why could that be a national anthem for the country? <laughs> <laughs> but the original song was one of a young man encountering a maiden or an image or a goddess in the morning at the dawning of the day, and she runs away from him. She won't marry him, she won't have him. So the common thread is uh, the failure of relationships of sorts, and. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more than that, and Michael has agreed to sing it once, but I wish he would sing it twice. First, <laughs> for the melody and the meaning that you can get, and second, for a deeper meaning. But he will at least sing it once for us, okay, Michael? All right. Michael, ladies and gentlemen, on Raglan Road. <laughs> On Raglan Road, on an autumn day, I met her first new. That her dark hair would weave a snare, that I might one day I saw the danger, yet I walked along the enchanted way. 
And I said, let grief be a fallen leaf at the dawning of the day. On Grafton Street in November, we tripped lightly along the ledge of the deep ravine where can be seen the worth of passion's pledge. The queen of hearts still making tarts and I not making hay. Oh, I love too much, and by such, by such is happiness thrown away. I gave her gifts of the mind, I gave her secret signs unknown. To the artists who have known, to gods of sound and stone, and word and tint I did not stint, for I gave her poems to say, and with her own name. And her own dark hair, light clouds over fields of May. On a quiet street where old ghosts meet, I see her walking now away from me. Hurriedly, my reason must allow that I had wooed not as I should a creature made of clay. Oh, the angel woos the clay. Michael Wynn 
was born in Ireland, but his mother was born in America, Michael. And he went back to Ireland after living here for a while, to Dublin, where he's literary. Why are you Ireland. Oh, no, no, no. No? Yeah, so Michael's a pure Irishman. That's why I knew he'd be able to sing the song. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he surprised me how well he sang it. I can hardly believe it. Michael was incredible. Excellent. I mean, I'm crying. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I should say, too, I'm sorry, but um, I, uh, my last name is O'Rourke. And I, I, you know, and I'm mostly Irish, and I thought that heritage of me was so boring. But I went to a genealogy class. I went to a genealogy class. And my great grandfather came from this part of Ireland, and they've been there since 1026, the old old clan. That, I mean, wow. You know, the Irish go deep. <coughs> 900 years. They got there before know? the Normans got there. That, well, that's where we're from, the Normans, right. But well, you're, a, you're a Norman from Ireland? Well, it's, uh -oh. it goes back to 1026. It goes back so deep, the Irish. No, but that's the 800 wow. years of trouble, starting with the Normans in Ireland. You know, well, the Normans invaded. Uh, Sorry, uh, I right. <laughs> <laughs> Are you about this? You know I mean? We should just let her get on stage and like perform. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. I think we have her on tape. We have her on tape. Just let her get with talk. We're going to have all sorts of comments from her. Irish uh, history in five minutes. Uh, Irish history in five minutes. Irish history goes back very, very far. All the trouble started with the Norman. But, yeah. <laughs> but my grandfather's half Norman and grandmother was all Irish, so. My father's name is Norman. Norman. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That a lot of trouble. Okay, Jeff. Jeff Miller. Let's welcome Jeff Miller. All right. This has nothing. Thank you. This has nothing to do with Ireland. So, so now for something completely different. Um, this is um, um, an exchange of views between uh, two ladies, frenemies. It's from uh, Moliere's *The Misanthrope* in Richard Wilbur's amazing verse translation. Uh, the two characters are um, the, uh, the <coughs> coquettish Seliman, who receives um, a surprise visit from the censorious lady Arsenoe. First Arsenoe, and then Seliman's reply. Madam, the flame of friendship ought to burn brightest in matters of the most concern. And as there's nothing that concerns us more than honor, I have hastened to your door to give you, as your friend, some information about the status of your reputation. I visited last night some virtuous spoke, and just by chance it was of you they spoke. Alas, there was no tendency to praise your light behavior and your dashing ways. The quantity of gentlemen you see and your by now notorious coquetry were both so vehemently criticized by everyone that I was much surprised. Of course, I needn't tell you where I stood. I came to your defense as best I could, assured them that you were harmless, <laughs> and declared your soul was absolutely unimpaired. But there are some things you must realize one can't excuse however much one tries, and I was forced at last into conceding that your behavior, madam, is misleading creates a bad impression, giving rise to ugly rumor and obscene surmise, and that if you were more overtly good, you wouldn't be so much misunderstood. Not that I think you've been unchaste, no, no, the saints preserve me from a thought so low, but mere good conscience never did suffice, one must avoid the outward show of vice. Madam, you're too intelligent, I'm sure, to think my motives anything but pure <coughs> in offering this counsel, which I do, out of a zealous interest in you. Seliman. Madam, I've not taken you amiss. I'm very much obliged to you for this, and I'll at once discharge the obligation by telling you about your reputation. <laughs> You've been so kind as to have let me know what certain people think of me, and so I mean to follow your benign example by offering you a somewhat similar sample. The other day, I went to an affair and found some most distinguished people there discussing piety, both false and true. The conversation soon came round to you. <laughs> Alas, your prudery and bustling zeal appeared to have a very slight appeal. 
your towering self-esteem, that pitying face with which you contemplate the human race, the aptitude of your suspicious mind for finding sin where there is none to find, your sermonizing and your sharp aspersions on others' pure and innocent diversions, all these were mentioned, madam, and in fact, were roundly and concertedly attacked. What good, they said, are all her outward shows when everything belies her pious pose? She prays incessantly, and yet, they say, she beats her maids and cheats them of their pay. She shows herself in every holy place, and yet she's vain enough to paint her face. She holds that naked statues are immoral, but with a naked man she'd have no quarrel. <laughs> <laughs> of course I said to everybody there that they were being viciously unfair. Still, they were inclined to criticize you and all agreed that someone should advise you to leave the morals of the world alone and worry rather more about your own. They said that one self-knowledge should be great before one thinks of setting others straight, that one should learn the art of living well before one thinks of setting men to hell, and that the church is best equipped, no doubt, to guide our souls and root our vices out. Madam, you're too intelligent, I'm sure, to think my motives anything but pure in offering this counsel, which I do, out of a zealous interest in you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Is it okay with you? You can focus on. 